Hey everyone, welcome to another dividend stock investing video. I want to cover a stock in the video today that I am purchasing myself. This is a core dividend stock that has tanked on its recent earnings announcement. Now this is not the 3M company, the one that I covered in my last video, which I'll link to in the description below. This is yet another dividend stock that has been tanking. And so that's a theme here in 2022. It's exciting as a long-term dividend stock investor to be able to buy tranches of my favorite stocks at attractive prices. If you haven't guessed yet, I'm going to cover in the video today the Clorox company. They make these disinfecting wipes that are so popular, of course, um, in our modern era right now. Although it's costing the Clorox company quite a bit more money to produce these wipes right now than it was just a year ago. Also, you may not know, but Clorox also produces a variety of other products at their company, including these Glad bags, which are pretty helpful. I always like Glad because I can rely on these as being strong and well-manufactured bags. And so, Basically, I'm going to cover their earnings in detail. What's going on with this company? Why is the stock tanking? Long story short, revenue is kind of okay, but earnings are tanking because input costs are really expensive, really high. So margins are shrinking. In particular, gross margins are shrinking. So I want to cover that. I want to cover some thoughts in the video today at a top level as a dividend investor, why I am not too scared by things like that. In fact, I welcome this kind of news as a long-term investor because I love averaging into my favorite stocks at attractive valuations. And so it's a psychological thing, if you will. I want to share some of the philosophy behind dividend stock investing. Also in the video today, I want to cover five dividend stocks that right now in 2022, right now in February, I am personally purchasing. I think all five are attractive for different reasons, but I want to share a sample five stock portfolio, if you will, that I am accumulating right now. Now I own 49 dividend stocks, but these are the five that I'm focused on right now in February, probably in March and April as well. Get ready everyone for a really exciting dividend stock investing video. Welcome to PPC Ian. This is Dividend Stock Investing for Everyone. All right, everyone. So I want to encourage all of you as we get started in the video today to please go ahead and smash the like button if you enjoy my videos here on YouTube. Many of um, you know I'm in the middle of a move right now, and so I'm kind of making do with kind of the studio setups that I can kind of um, create on the fly. I was out earlier today trying to do this video in a park-like setting. That just did not work out. And so I have this makeshift studio right here. I hope it turns out well. There's a lot of effort that went into this video. So your likes, your support, subscriptions, comments mean the world to me. Without further ado, as you can see on the screen in front of you right now, I want to share my recent buy order of the Clorox company. And so, in fact, I purchased more shares of Clorox today. And by the way, if you're not on my Patreon yet, check that out in the pinned comment below. I share all of my stock trades on Patreon at the backyard level and the corner level gets even more bonus content, but all levels on Patreon get my trades. And this is the one I made today of Clorox. I was able to purchase at $142.01. And based on the forward 2022 EPS estimate of 449, the PE that I got today was a 31.63. So very high PE, but I think that's misleading because the earnings are just terrible this year. And I think they will start bouncing back as soon as next year, because as you can see, 2023 EPS estimate is 606, which places the forward PE next year at a 23. And I imagine that this trend will continue. So I think sometimes when a stock, a company is facing trouble and it's tanking, the shorter term PEs are a little bit misleading because of course it's tanking on bad earnings. That's 
um, indicative right here in the PE ratio. Now for some historical context, Clorox is down at $142 one penny where I bought it today. It's all the way down from 236.51 recent high during the pandemic when everyone was purchasing those disinfecting wipes and other Clorox cleaning products and when their input costs weren't so bad. So margins were good. They're making a lot of money. It probably got a bit ahead of itself. Now I started buying Clorox in 2011 at $68.67. So whereas I'm happy to accumulate more shares in the $140 range, I was buying as low as $68 back in 2011. And that's the power of long-term investing. That's the power of just having the right perspective as well. Um, but I'm happy to acquire at these prices as I did today. The dividend is $1.16 per quarter, dividends per year, $4.64. And so the starting yield is now a 3.27, which is really, really solid for Clorox for this interest rate environment. Now, what I don't like is the payout ratio this year is over 100%. It's at 103.3%. Will they cut the dividend? I don't think so. Will they really slow down the rate of which they've been increasing the dividend, maybe even do no increase this next time around? Quite possibly. Although the payout ratio next year in 2023 is going to drop all the way down to 76.6%, uh, .6%, and I believe 2024 will be even better. But I think what's going to happen is this dividend growth rate that we all love at Clorox, which is 7.7%, per year on average for the last five years, that's not sustainable. I think that's going to slow down to about 0% for the next, say, three, four years until they can figure out these sky-high input costs. I think they're either going to have to pass along uh, price increases to the consumers. They're going to have to change the kind of formulation and how they produce their products. Um, they're going to have to probably use more technology, more automation, maybe perhaps in their manufacturing, or maybe all of the above. The market cap here is $17 billion, and I believe we're in a winner-takes-all economy, and so smaller companies like this, sometimes they can get hit a lot harder by high input costs versus some of their peers like Procter & Gamble, which I also own, um, which honestly are doing... Um, just fine right now. I don't see any particular issues with uh, Procter & Gamble company right now. But obviously, as you just saw, the stock chart is down. The company is plummeting. It's because the gross margins are getting squeezed so bad in this inflationary environment that we're in. And um, one thing I would just say off the bat with this particular scenario, with this particular stock, in the modern day, 2022, it's rare that there's kind of a value in a stock for no reason. Usually when there's a value, it's because something's going wrong. As an investor, I like to pick scenarios where I think something's going wrong, but I think the company will make it through it, especially when I look out decades into the future. And those are the opportunities I like to jump on. So obviously I'm taking a calculated risk here that I think Clorox will sustain the dividend and in the long, long run start increasing it again and that they're going to make it through this and that they're going to be just fine. But obviously in the short term, yeah, it is a little scary here because the numbers are terrible. And that's what I want to show you next. As you can see on the screen right now in front of you, you can see Clorox reports their Q2 fiscal year 2022 uh, results and they update their outlook. Basically, as you can see on the screen, the sales are declining a bit, but honestly, that's not too bad. You're going to see in a minute that sales are actually doing just fine versus the two year ago period. They're declining versus last year, but that's to be expected because there was a kind of uh, peak of demand for these cleaning products that is now subsiding because we're exiting from this global pandemic. And so obviously it's going to trade a little bit um, counter cyclical with the trends of the pandemic. And uh, so I'm not so, so concerned about the sales. And you'll see that in a minute. Uh, what I am concerned about is gross margin decreased uh, 1,240 basis points from uh, to 33%. It dropped all the way from 45% to 33%. For those of you that don't know, gross margin is kind of the topmost margin that you can see on the income statement. Usually the way it's calculated is you take the revenue, which is the sales, you subtract out the cost of those goods, the cost of producing those goods, the cost to make those glad bags or those Clorox wipes, and you get gross, uh, gross profit. You take gross profit, you divide by revenue, you get gross margin. It gives a sense of just how efficient a company is at producing the products that it can sell. And as you see on the screen right now in front of you with Clorox, that gross margin is absolutely 
tanking. And why is it tanking? Uh, higher, higher cost of production, manufacturing, logistics, commodity prices are skyrocketing. And um, yeah, that's, that is a little bit concerning here. And I think we're still exiting the pandemic. So there is a supply chain issue. There is an inflation issue. There was a lot of economic stimulus and interest rate easing that uh, is causing an inflationary environment. I think as the Fed uh, tightens down on interest rates a bit in upcoming uh, quarters and years, and I think as we exit from this pandemic and things get a little bit more normal, perhaps those input costs won't be inflating quite as quickly. But we shall see. It's a calculated risk I'm taking, and it's a big, it's a big thing. There's no, there's no way around it. That's why the stock is absolutely plummeting. You can see the diluted net earnings per share declined 72% year over year. 72%. They just got clobbered on their earnings per share because of this gross margin issue. And adjusted EPS declined 67%. And um, year-to-date net cash provided by operations is declining 65%. And so this is obviously pretty terrible news, but I want to dig in a little bit more to show you how at a fundamental top-line level, the demand for the products that this company sells are very strong in all segments. And so I'm not concerned about demand. I'm not concerned about sales growth. I'm not concerned as much about the product portfolio. I'm concerned about this company getting a handle on these input costs or at a very minimum starting to pass some of these input costs along to the consumer. So as you can see in front of you right now, they operate in three business segments. The first one is health and wellness. And so this is the cleaning professional products. They got some vitamins actually, uh, supplements too, but you can see net sales declined 21% and it is reflecting decreases in all of these businesses related to health and wellness. Now, where is the net sales decline 21% from a year ago period? You can see on a two-year stack basis, net sales grew 21%. So obviously there was an anomaly year here and they're up 21% from the two-year ago period. So again, I'm not concerned with the top line, with the revenue. Let's keep going. As you can see in front of you on the screen right now, I wanna to move to their next business segment, which is household. And that is the bags like the Glad bags I showed you, grilling, they own um, charcoal, uh, uh, cat litter. The net sales increased um, year over year, 3%. That is fabulous. And you can see on a two-year stack basis, net sales grew 23%. And so again, last year was an anomaly year. And on a two-year basis, they are growing really quickly, but even on a one-year basis for this segment, they're growing. Let's keep going. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the third division that I want to go through is lifestyle, and that includes food, um, natural, uh, personal care, water filtration. They own Brita water filters, for example. Net sales increased year over year. So again, we're starting to see health and wellness is the only segment where sales are decreasing year over year. And again, that's pandemic uh, driven, but you can see here on a two year stack basis, net sales grew 11% for lifestyle. So, again, for health and wellness, sales are up to on the two year basis, household up on the one year and two year basis, lifestyle on a um, one year and two year basis. And I almost forgot, in fact, this company has yet another division. They have an international division. So, as you can see in front of you right now, they break that down into a different category. International. Net sales were flat, but on a two-year stack basis, they grew 23%. And I would love to see more international growth at this company. And that's what we're seeing right here, um, which, is, which is fabulous. And so um, this company, when I remember looking a while ago at their breakdown by geography, their international sales probably uh, quite smaller at their business. And so there's probably a lot of room to increase the international sales at the Clorox company. And so again, I'm not so concerned with the top line. Let's keep going. As you can see in front of you right now on the screen, they want to give an outlook and they're saying they're updating their outlook. Basically, they see net sales decline of 1% to 4%, organic 1% to 4%. That's their fiscal 2022 um, outlook. Obviously, that's driven, as we just saw, by the uh, healthcare cleaning uh, uh, 
type products. And um, you can see the company expects sales to return to its long-term sales growth target of three to 5% by the fourth quarter. So they're seeing things turn around most likely by the end of this fiscal year. And you can see here, they update their diluted EPS, their adjusted EPS forecasts quite a bit. And so the, the bad part here is because the gross margins are getting squeezed so poorly, it really filters through on the bottom line. And you saw that on the first uh, chart that I showed today, just my little snapshot of my purchase, that they're barely covering the dividend. At least, in fact, they're um, not covering it uh, by a few percentage points there. And that's because the bottom line is terrible because of input costs. And you'll see on the screen in front of you right now, the next screenshot that I wanna show this is actually their income statement. And this is from their recent earnings report. And you can see a few things here. What you can see is most importantly, cost of products sold. Boy, those costs are just sky high. And you can see gross profit is getting squeezed. As you look further down on the statement, like uh, G&A selling general and administrative expenses, they're keeping those under control. In fact, they're coming down. You can see advertising costs. They're keeping those under control. They're coming down. Research and development. I don't like to see research and development go down, but I think they're doing whatever they can at this point to cut costs because the margins are so bad at the top uh, gross profit level, but it's down. Uh, interest expense, down. And so what you're starting to see here is a story and you're seeing that the bottom line earnings per share, they are just getting absolutely clobbered by the top line gross profit, just getting squeezed by input costs. And so anyone investing in the company here, myself included, are taking a calculated risk that over long periods of time, they're gonna figure out the input costs one way or another, and that we're gonna to revert to the mean. Just as during the pandemic, this stock was sky high and everyone was buying the wipes, um, we're kind of coming off those highs here. We're starting to resume their normal trajectory of three to 5% revenue growth over the long term on average. I would say the input costs have accelerated to a sky high level, I think, what I'm taking the bet is things will revert to the mean on the input costs a little bit as well. And if they don't, they're gonna start finding even more efficiencies and, and probably price increases passing it along to the consumer. But I love this company as a long-term investor. I'm looking at dividend stock investing in the decades, not in the years. And that brings me to my next point. I wanna share some philosophy around dividend stock investing. Before I do so though, please go ahead and smash the like button. If you have not already, it means the world to me. I'm doing my best on this video here. This has been a tough one uh, with the location and everything. And uh, anyways, your support means the world. Don't forget to subscribe as well. My dream is to reach 100,000 subscribers. So I eventually get that silver play button here on YouTube. And don't forget to check out my Patreon. I will include a link in the pinned comment below. At the corner patron level, I actually have um, access to my complete dividend stock portfolio percentage allocation to each position and um, bonus videos all the time. And at the backyard level, I have all my stock trades and I have a bunch of historical bonus videos as well. And there's just so much valuable content there for all of the patrons and your support helps fuel what I'm doing here on YouTube and beyond. All right, everyone. So as you can see on the screen in front of you right now, I have a bunch of stuff I want to go through because I am seeing so much chatter in the community right now about Clorox. And it really shows me quite frankly, boy, I'm not so sure dividend stock investing is for everyone and that's okay. I I should be more clear about what I'm saying. The whole thesis of this channel is, hey, dividend stock investing for everyone. I believe it's a tool that anyone and everyone can use to improve upon their financial situation because they can use dividends to automate income that can alleviate the need to work and eventually live one's dream lifestyle, which is more aligned with their interests versus a job they may or may not like. And dividend stock investing is one of the only 
avenues available to the average everyday person in our complex world where it is so difficult to start your own business or to be an entrepreneur. One can be an entrepreneur of sorts by building a dividend portfolio. So dividend stocks are for everyone. But what I'm saying is whereas they are for everyone, they may not be for everyone because I get all these comments all the time on my Facebook group, for example, Ian, oh my goodness, it doesn't work. Look at Clorox. It's underperforming the market over the last year. And so I want to actually take a, a step back here and just share some perspective because I want folks watching this channel to figure out what works for them. Because everyone as an investor has different goals. My goals are having a minimum of portfolio volatility, having a portfolio that can last into the future for generations, a portfolio that throws off massive cash flow while having less max drawdown than the index. That's me. I want to live off of the cash flow and I want to sleep well at night. There are other people that are looking to accumulate a portfolio that's worth a lot of money. They want the capital appreciation because they plan to sell off parts of the portfolio to pay for bills. That's not me. I plan to never sell. And so for me, dividend investing all the way every day, given my risk tolerance and given what I'm trying to build, it works for me. But I hear Ian, oh my goodness, what are you going to do? Clorox stock is down boy, I don't care. I'm going to buy more. I love it because I can buy more cash flow for the same amount of money deployed. But as you can see on the screen right now, what I want to share with you is these folks saying that dividend investing doesn't work. Let's just look at this a minute. S&P 500 index fund, and I'm not putting that down. I think that could be part of a dividend oriented portfolio or even could replace the dividend strategy for people who are not as aligned with a dividend uh, strategy. Dividends, maybe it's not quite aligned with what everyone is trying to accomplish. But what I just want to say about the S&P 500 right now is it has a very low yield, about 1.27%. There is not meaningful cash flow that's going to come from the S&P. And I think increasingly over long periods of time, that yield is going to stay low, if not go lower, because there's a high tech concentration the top 10 holdings in the index are largely tech companies, many of which pay no dividend, and that is uh, representing 30% of the S&P index. And so as tech companies take over more market cap in this winner-takes-all economy, the S&P index is going to have less and less dividend yield because many of these companies do not plan on ever paying a dividend. I would say the S&P 500, based on my analysis, tends to have a higher drawdown in bad times than dividend stocks, a little bit more volatility, if you will, on the downside. And so what I'm just saying is there's nothing wrong with dividend stocks and index funds. There's nothing wrong with index funds, but they provide very different solutions for different goals, different risk tolerances. And what I want to do is I want to take a look at some long-term charts for a minute. It does work. One of the things I want to say is a lot of these charts, they don't even factor in the power of reinvested dividends. They're just looking at stock prices. And don't forget that a lot of these companies that are skyrocketing in price, they do pay a dividend. Like Apple is one I own and Bitcoin, it's not a stock, it's a commodity, if you will, but it throws off cash flow if it's held in the right place. And so I want to actually just go through a few charts. Let's do that. So as you can see on the screen right now in front of you, let's just look at this for a minute. Let's start with Clorox. And so the first chart I'm showing from Google Finance is Clorox. This is a all-time chart. And you can see, even though it's tanking in recent years, it's up over all time. And when I looked, I could not find whether Google Finance includes the power of reinvested dividends or not. But to the best of my knowledge, I don't think it does. And so this does not even include the power of reinvesting dividends, which is huge for something like Clorox. And so over very long periods of time, yes, dividend stock investing works just fine. I want to show you even with Clorox plummeting, it's worked more or less pretty well over the last five years as well. And so as you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the next chart that I want to illustrate shows the five year for Clorox. And you can see over the last five years, honestly, it's kept up with the index pretty well. I like that it was kind of doing the reverse of the index during the pandemic. So it provides a nice buffer to the portfolio. I like positions that kind of trend in different ways in the portfolio to further reduce my uh, drawdown in any weird situations like that, like we had in um, that 2020 time period uh, and uh, throughout kind of early 2021. But as you can see, honestly, it's really only in the last year where the two flipped. It's really only in the last year where the index is vastly outperforming Clorox. Um, 
over all of these long periods of time that we've been looking at. And so what I would say is it's very, very difficult to compare one individual stock to an entire index over a one year period of time. But when I look at long periods of time, I'm liking what I see at Clorox, and I think it's doing just fine versus the index. And I think it's even further doing fine when we look at the dividend and reinvesting the dividend or using the, the dividend to pay bills. I want to keep going. There are some companies you may not even think are doing that well versus the index that are doing just fine. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the next one that I want to go through is a company called Norfolk Southern. Believe it or not, this is a railroad that I own. Over very long periods of time, it is doing just fine versus the index. You can see Norfolk Southern is the blue line. The index is the yellow gold line. Again, this company is beating the index over the long run. Who would have thought it is a railroad company, whereas the index has 30% of the top uh, of its weighting in the top 10 positions. And of those top 10, most of them are tech focused. Who would have thought? But even over the last five years, as you can see on the screen in front of you right now, I want to um, show you that Norfolk Southern, a railroad, the blue line, it's doing just fine versus the index. I want to keep going. I want to share one more example on the screen with all of you right now. Check it out right now. This is Air Products and Chemicals, another company that I own. Not a tech company, but just a um, dividend company. I love this one. It's doing just fine versus the index over the long run. As you can see, the blue line versus the yellow gold line. Again, I don't even think this includes the dividends. I couldn't quite get to the bottom of that, but to my research, it didn't seem that it did. Um, and obviously, we know that Air Products and Chemicals is very strong on not only the dividend, but the dividend growth. And then I want to show you, well, what's happening in the last five years? As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, you can see that Air Products and Chemicals more or less is keeping up with the index over the last five years. It's tapered off a bit recently, and so it's kind of keeping par. But the point of these charts that I wanted to illustrate to everyone is when things go bad for a single stock, I see a logical fallacy that a lot of people out there who are investors are like, hey, you can't beat the index. But it is so hard to keep track of one stock versus an entire index, especially when you're looking at a one year period of time. And now, of course, I'm using the same logical fallacy in this video in some ways and that I'm cherry picking stocks like Norfolk Southern Air Products and Chemicals and looking at them versus the index. So, and these are ones that have done really well. But the point that I'm trying to make is even a company like Clorox, which has absolutely plummeted in the recent year, it's doing just fine versus the index over long periods of time. And even over the last five years, until the last year, it's, uh, it's done just fine. And when you think that you have a well-constructed portfolio of dividend stocks, I have 49 of them, and I start looking at all of those versus the index, honestly, it's meeting my goals just fine on capital appreciation, although I don't really have capital appreciation goals because I'm investing for cash flow. And the cash flow, it's certainly over indexing versus the index and meeting my needs with less max drawdown in the bad times. But here, listen to this. If dividend investing is not for you, or it only is going to be a part of your strategy, that makes sense too. I'm not saying my strategy is the only one. I'm just saying my strategy for what I'm trying to accomplish works pretty darn well. Let's keep going. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the next thing I want to share is um, patience is just key. You don't invest in dividends to beat the index in one year, three year, five years, or even 10 year periods. You invest in dividend stocks for low volatility, passive income that can free you. It can free your life. Think in decades, not years. That's what I'm doing. Do what's right for you. Only you're going to know what's right for you. And so, uh, by the way, put in the comments below, what do you think? Do you think dividend investing is just a losing strategy or do you see a lot of value in it like I do? I think all of us are so different. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. There's no right or wrong answer. And uh, folks who are investing in index funds for total returns, if your goal is total returns and that's your only goal and you're looking to sell off stock in the future to pay for whatever you have to pay for in retirement, indexing is not a bad strategy for that. In in fact, it's a great strategy for that. That's just not my strategy. That doesn't happen to be my strategy. And so um, mine is, again, as you guys know, cash flow. Let's keep going. I want to close out the video today with five stocks that I love right now. In February of 2022, as you can see in front of you right now, I have a little cheat sheet. These are the five stocks. I know sometimes you all 
really enjoy it when I do these little portfolios. I have them stack ranked in order. I'm not going to go through all the metrics, but you can see I listed Johnson & Johnson as number one. I love that forward PE of the 16. I love that payout ratio, which is so low. Uh, Raytheon Technologies. I love the... Um, exposure that gives me at a reasonable price to industrials, to aerospace, to defense. I desperately need that exposure because I have a lot of stocks like Clorox. I have a lot of CPG stocks and we can see that those CPG stocks are getting hit hard by the inflationary pressures. So I want to add and bolster up areas of my portfolio that are trading at reasonable valuations that provide some diversification. And Raytheon Technologies does just that. I've got Starbucks in there. It's below $100. That forward PE is high, but the 2023 one I don't list here is lower. And uh, the five-year dividend growth rate, uh, compound annual growth rate on average is 14% per year, and the payout ratio is still reasonably low. I love that about Starbucks, and I think that's going to be a dividend growth stock that gives an immense yield on cost over the long run. I have 3M here, the topic of my last video. I love that forward PE of the 15.83. The starting yield is solid. I'll link in the pinned comment and the description to my last video about 3M, and now I'm listing Clorox, which I bought today with that solid dividend yield of 3.25%, but that payout ratio scares me a bit, and so we shall see what happens with that dividend over time. I am making the calculated bet that they will resume dividend growth probably three, four years out once they get through all of the mess we're facing right now. And when all of us investors look back at 2022 with hindsight, it's going to be so interesting to see where the decisions um, I'm making right now, for example, are they good decisions or bad ones? We'll see when our future selves look back, I'm making the calculated bet here that these are some pretty good decisions given all of the information that I have right now. All right, everyone. If you enjoyed the video today, don't forget to smash that like button. It means the world to me. Don't forget to subscribe with that notification bell as well. I want to reach 100,000. It would mean the world for the community to support me in reaching that goal and getting that silver play button. Thank you, everyone, for watching today. In terms of full disclosure, I am long the stocks mentioned today. I am long Johnson & Johnson, ticker JNJ. I am long Raytheon Technologies, RTX. I am long Starbucks, SBUX, 3M, MMM, Clorox, CLX. I am long Bitcoin, BTC, Apple, AAPL, Air Products and Chemicals, APD, Norfolk Southern, NSC, Procter & Gamble Company, PG. I own all of those stocks in my personal dividend stock portfolio and Bitcoin in my crypto portfolio. I'll link in the pinned comment. I have a crypto channel about crypto for cash flow. It's a smaller percentage of what I do, but it's really cool. I'm earning a lot of cash flow over there in crypto, so check that out. And don't forget to check out my Patreon as well in the pinned comment before I leave today in terms of a friendly disclaimer. Today's video, it's not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. Today's video, it's just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult your licensed financial advisor first. I'm just sharing my journey here on YouTube. For fun and entertainment, it's possible to lose money in the stock market. We've seen that with Clorox, especially in short periods of time. So please consult your financial advisor first. What I'm doing here in the stock market is very unique and specialized to my situation. So I'm just sharing my journey here for fun and entertainment. I love you all. Thank you for the support. I'll see you in the next video. I wish you all an amazing day. Mm -hmm.